Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of The Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Matthias Lachman, Professor in Sports Science from the University of Erlanden, Nuremberg, to speak all about the latest changes to the German youth development system. Matthias, welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, Matthias, as we begin the podcast with everyone, can you please elaborate and tell everybody listening what was your first football memory? My first football memory? Uh, I have to think about it. Yeah. Um, it was kicking with um, my father, brothers, and different people in different ages um, at the, um, the grass pitch um, in, at the school nearby our house. So in each evening, we went out and maybe 10 to 15 people started to use a ball, girls, boys, adults, children, and uh, four bottles or shoes and marked two goals and started to kick. This is my first memory about football. And of course, you've had quite a football upbringing, you know, a career in the game as a professional player, as a coach with Mainz in Germany, but you've probably become most renowned, I would say, for your work as a professor in the university, which, you know, kind of sounds like an innovation hub for sports science, Matthias, if I'm correct. Yeah, I started to build an innovation hub um, in sports sciences and it is strongly related to soccer. So I um, had different ideas in the last years. Since, since 10 years, uh, I, I, I wrote five patents and these ideas went into um, technological innovations. So one you know maybe is uh, um, the skill, skills lab from Austria. This is um, a 360 degree environment uh, where shooting machines uh, throw balls to a player and in the center and uh, a player has to handle these balls and put the, the ball as soon as possible into different targets and in this area i uh, wrote two patents and later on i had ideas to use um, led colors on the shirt and mark with led colors the goals and the shirts from the players and design new games um, that you can use your smartphone and use an app in the smartphone to switch between different games and change suddenly the color of the goal and the, suddenly the color of the team so you always have different conditions um, um, in which you have to play and these conditions are tactic different tactical demands you have to follow and the light helps you um, to mark a, um, uh, an area or a goal or a teammate. And this means your brain has to rethink um, maybe every 20 seconds and analyze the new situation and adapt as soon as possible to the new situation. And this was um, the core of another three. And so we founded a company to bring this to life and uh, at first we crashed, uh, but now this idea is um, reborn by a new company. And hopefully in end of uh, 2022, uh, we will see the product again in the market. And uh, this was really a big thing because this product um, is related to uh, the small sided games uh, where we use four goals um, and the shooting zone and three versus four three from horse wine, the so-called mini soccer or mini football, or later he decided to uh, say Funinho to this, uh, uh, an artificial word. It is, uh, um, it has two parts. The first part is fun. Um, and the second part is uh, Nino. Uh, this is the uh, Spanish word for children. Yeah? Also in, in free translation, you can say fun, uh, designed for children yeah. and i suppose <laughs> what makes me curious matthias is what put you down this line of work within football because i'd known you had been a player beforehand you were a coach 
So what sparked your curiosity to kind of get creative and look for new solutions and generate new ideas? So can you repeat it? I had a, I had a problem to understand it clearly. Yeah, no problem. So I suppose what um, what made you curious about creativity in football? Were these ideas you had generated whilst you were a player or whilst you were a coach? Okay. Um, these ideas came uh, during my um, living as a coach. So I was a former player in a, a German second league club, Darmstadt 98. Um, this club now has the chance to go up to first league again, but this is more than 20 years ago. And um, I played in the youth there and um, I had some ideas, but not so clear. And after my career as a coach, um, I decided to invent new things. Um, this is in my nature, so just do it as the, as the uh, core sentence. And um, so there, there was, a, in 2003, Horst Wein came to Mainz 05. Mainz 05 was the club where I uh, was responsible for the under 15 in 2003, 4 and 5. And the German Soccer Federation uh, decided to send Horst Wein uh, to the clubs and um, teach the coaches from the under 15 uh, in small-sided games approach. And so in this moment, I, I studied uh, or I was finished with studying sports and physics and a little bit of medicine. And I had all my coaching licenses. But then I learned that I know nothing. Okay, so before um, I came together with Horst, I was a little bit arrogant and in my mind was the idea, I know a lot of football and I'm a very good coach, blah, blah. But after I saw what Horst teached me, uh, I, have, I had to uh, rethink myself and said, no, no, uh, you know nothing. You have to uh, rebuild your knowledge. Yeah? And the key thing, he gave me was the so-called game intelligence approach. So um, he, he started to think the football from four relevant phases. So if you try to find a solution in football or in a team sport or in, other, in any sport, at first you have to uh, observe the environment. Second, you have to understand what's going on on basis of your information. And third, you have to take the decision and the last phase is to execute the things. Yeah? And if you analyze the training approaches of all the sports in the world, then you can see 80, 90% is fixed on the execution phase. And no, uh, close to nobody has really good ideas how you address the first three phases um, in this process. So this process has four phases. Again, observation, yeah. then um, thinking, underst also understanding, and decision-making, and execution. And so he designed training methods that include all the things. And this was the big, big difference. And the next step was that he was able to build rules in the game, uh, uh, which you can use to address these recognition processes. A, an example is if you place two goals 12 to 14 meters in distance, you have to rotate with your head. The closer you come to the goal, you have to rotate to see what's going on on the other side of the pitch. If you only have a centered goal, then your focus is only to the centered goal. And he learned, and I learned too, uh, that you can use these changes in the environment to educate the football players. So if you place two goals 12 meters in distance, then the children immediately, uh, they start to look to the other goals in age five, six, seven, because they know if this goal is closed, I can switch the direction, can go to the other goal. Yeah? And um, the goal is a reward system. You have, to, uh, you have to know if you think from the dopamine side, you have to know that uh, we have two reward systems for the children. The first is the ball 
and the second is the goal. And you can use these reward systems and place them on different areas in the pitch. And uh, he did um, to develop ideas, then he created a shooting zone. And this shooting zone only allows players to score um, closer than six meters to the goal. And with this shooting zone, you prevent that the children play a kick and rush um, like the old English style. And um, so on and so forth. And he developed close to 12 different um, aspects that you can change in designing a game to educate players. And this was a really big step. Step I understood this concept, yeah, the game intelligence approach. And I noticed that I'm now able to create my own world by applying these rules to develop players. And at the end, this leads uh, to the uh, unbelievable thing that you do less as coach and the players do more because the environment starts to educate the players. Yeah. And another advantage is if you can do this, you bring quality into um, the education because the environment is always the same and the rule is always the same. It doesn't matter if my wife is on the pitch and explain the rules to the children and set the cons to the right um, places. The rules do the work for you. Yeah? And then with this kind of approach, you make uh, quality independent from the coach because the rules um, start to coach the players and this is such a powerful um this is such a powerful idea you can use this idea to unbelievable things uh, so one thing is to uh, do a training another thing is to construct standard situations another thing is to de design the competition mode of a nation how i did uh, for germany yeah and now for switzerland and for austria as well and the next thing is you can use it to um, to educate coaches, as I explained. If a coach knows all these 12 um, changing rules, he can uh, use the different degrees of freedom uh, to build um, a tailor-made environment to achieve his education goals. And what you can do is to, um, uh, to measure the quality of a coach, how good um is the coach in applying these rules and you can use this concept to um design new education courses for coaches and all these steps uh, now we can go um, and the first step um we we uh, brought to millions of children now is to use these rules to design a new competition system tailor-made to the children and it took me five years um, to bring the federation to the point where they understood, oh, yes, this is right. Uh, we can use this. This is very powerful. And this will uh, bring more and more children uh, to the game and keep the children into the game and increase the quality of the soccer education by uh, using this education or uh, this competition system. It's absolutely fascinating, Matthias, and it goes against the traditional approach, which is you must adapt the players to fit your environment. What you're in fact doing is you're adapting the environment to fit the players yeah. in front of you. And you have one beautiful phrase in German, which translates directly to English, and I've heard you speak about this before, where you call the rules of provocation, where they provoke behaviors which you want. Yeah, this is provocational, using provocational rules. This is not an, a new story, but the problem is in sports sciences, we have a lot of theory, which is not applied. Yeah. So we had 40 years in Germany, a, um, a competition system that worked against the education uh, rules. And we only heard in the trainer um, uh, a coaching uh, and, and, and the coaching uh clinics from the federation yeah you should do this and this and this but nobody did it really yeah it was only theory and the question is um if you would like to uh, change the world you have to apply the theory into the practice and this is the main thing we have this in our uh, society in so many fields so nobody knows we uh, we have to have 
um, renewable energies. Uh, but what do we do? We use uh, the, the carboxide um, producing energy resources. This is completely stupid. We know what we have to do, but we are not able as society to change the rules in the, in the right um, behavior. The same is in the school system. Everybody knows that the uh, um, frontal teaching to 30 uh, pupils is wrong. But all over the world, we do this. This is stupid. Yeah? And uh, the same we have in, in football. This is only a small thing I targeted. This is, was the first step to target the competition system, the, all the other things we have to target in the future, uh, designing the standard situations, designing the new coaching courses, designing um, the soccer education and designing the, how we um, measure the quality of a coach and yeah, how we optimize the whole training process. So this is all the future. This was from the domino system, the first stone which we kicked. Yeah? But it is good because uh, we kicked it in the biggest uh, sports federation in the world, the German Soccer Federation. And this now is a blueprint for others because everybody is asking now, why do the German studio things? And um, so what you can see, Switzerland did the changes, um, Austria for some, week, some weeks ago, and we have much more potential. And people um, have to learn that we can use uh, environment and rules like laws yeah, to bring things in the right direction. Um, I give you an example. The biggest um, uh, in medicine, um, one of the biggest things was to cleaning the water from bacteria yeah, in the past, because 200 years ago, if you drank water, there was a high probability that you will get an infection. You can understand? And you have two ways to change this. You can say to the people, okay, you have to cook the water and the bacteria will die and then you can drink. Or you clean the water in central stations and bring it clean to the people. So what is more successfully? What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> What is more successfully? Is it more successfully to tell everybody in the world, cook the water and uh, then you can drink? Or is it more successfully to have cleaning stations all over the country and bring the water in the pipes cleaned to the persons? But it what seems, is more successfully? It seems to me, Matthias, though, that there's a mistaking of the map for the territory because you speak about the DFB as the world's largest sporting organization. But within yeah. that, I think it's 99.6% of its members are amateur players. Yeah. Yet we continually let down kids. Why? Because we look at the game as reverse engineered from the field of football itself. When in reality, we should be deconstructing first principles from the game itself. Case in point being, um, how do you expect your right centre back to switch the play to your left back in a seven aside or a nine aside game in under sevens or under eights. At that age, they don't have the mitochondria and the legs to switch the play. So for me, it's really cause and effect. And I think there's something here to be said about change because you personally, I know you've advocated this concept of Fonino and small side of games since 2015. And sometimes we know with change, it's like turning an oil tanker around. Yeah. And in Germany, we could see that changing tradition, in fact, was only really possible when the pain of failure became too strong after the 2018 yeah. World Cup. Yeah, th this is a, um, uh, yeah, this we know in the society that the time for changes is a crisis. Uh, so we see it now in Europe, um, the dependency of the gas and oil from Russia. Um, everybody knew, knew, knows that this is not um, a good thing um, from different perspective. The one thing is the dependency and the other thing is to using, still using um, car carbon dioxide um, producing energy resources. And 
now the crisis leads us to go this way using renewable energies much faster. Yeah? It needs always a crisis. This is because the you, our human brain is, to desi is designed to store energy. You have to think, you have to um, learn this, or you have to take this into account if you like to would like to do changes. Why? In, we have bodies, the same bodies um, as human beings five thousand years ago. Yeah, we have the same bodies from the biological side. Yeah, but our society changes in a way that our bodies are not no longer um, designed uh, to this new society. Yeah, therefore we have obesity and all these things. Yeah, because all the people with obesity, they had um, five hundred years ago a big advantage because their body was able to store better the energy, but now is a disadvantage. Yeah, you you understand, and. Um, our brain is designed to store energy. Why? We try to learn in our younger years um, rules and things. And then if we learn this, the brain started to reduce energy because the body tries always to save energy to keep the body in life. Yeah? This is a core principle of nature. Try to store energy and learning processes always waste energy. It's not a wasting, but it is a consumption. And if you rethink things and do permanently other things, your brain uses um, um, glucose. And this um, means you use energy and your tr uh, brain tries to reduce these energy consumptions. And how can you uh, reduce energy consumption? You learn something and then you know something. And then you can do it during sleeping. Yeah, you can drive your car. You don't think I have to put um, the first uh, into the first. Uh, what is the name? Uh, yeah, yeah. The gear. Yeah, using the gear by hand. It you you don't think about these things. You can drive the car and uh, making a telephone call because you can drive the car blindly. Your body don't any uh, any longer uses energy and. If somebody comes like me and says to you, hey boy, you have to learn something because what you do, we have a system that is 50% better. Then you, you start immediately to think, okay, is it worth to go that way? Because now I have to be active, I have to activate myself, I have to bring energy into my brain and I have a solution. Yeah, maybe my solution works, not 100%, but it works. Why I should learn something new? You, the same is by using a computer program. If there's a new version of Windows, what's going on? At first, you look at this icon and this icon and you say, shit, yeah, um, all my old ways to use the software. Yeah. And then suddenly you adapt and you learn, oh, there are some advantages. Yeah, but if you are not open-minded and if you do not know that this is necessary, then you are not open to, for the change. And this is the problem we have all over the world and depends on our biology. So we have to uh, take this into account if we would like to drive changes that the biology always try to save energy. This is the real reason why we have such an, um, a problem to drive innovations. And if we look at what that means for the future player, Matthias, very much independent of the coach, very creative and very authentic in their own decision making. I mean, is there a danger that we come back in eight to 10 years time and there's a problem in Germany saying that oh, all these creative players, they can't play together in part as one system? Because at the end of the day, what I bring it back to is one quote from the great... Um, Bill Shankly at Liverpool, when he spoke about a football team, says you need, you need eight players to carry the piano, three players to play it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you think as a team, then it's, um, if you would like to be successful as a team, then you need these um, people who, uh, who take the piano and you need the other guys who play the piano. If you have 
uh, in one team, 11 piano players definitely will not work. Yeah. Um, so the question is, from which perspective do you think? Um, I think from uh, helping every individual to reach its potential. Yeah? This is for me education. Helping people to reach their potential. This potential is given by nature. Yeah? Everybody of us has a potential. You have a potential for maximum speed, you have a potential for maximum force, and in the intelligence is uh, the same. Yeah, And this comes from our uh, desoxyribonuclein acid. But we have the environment which can tap the potential. And um, who I am to say to this person, oh, you are not allowed uh, to tap your potential because I... Um, have in mind that you will be in the future a, a carrier and not a piano player. Who I am. Yeah. And this means if you go to, back to the values, and this was uh, the core of uh, the changes. So I used this, the 10 values or the rights of the children from the UNICEF organization yeah? and applied this as a matrix to the uh, soccer education system in Germany. And I found with the young people together that six of these 10 rights of the children were negatively targeted by the um, competition system. Yeah. If you have a system that uh, um, bring children to the bench, then something is wrong. You have to design the system in a way that there is no bench in, this, in, uh, in the system. Yeah. Then you are familiar with the values and so we applied these 10 values uh, for the children from the UNICEF to analyze the system and we said at first the new system that we designed from the scratch has to fulfill or um, has not be in contradiction to these values yeah this was the core and we found the solution and um, this means I come back to uh, um, the potential. This means giving, giving everybody the chance to tap the full potential. You cannot tap the full potential if you say to a children age six or seven, you will be a carrier and you will be a piano player. But people do. True. But I think at the end of the day, Matthias, there's a healthy balance because you don't want to eliminate winning and losing from that conversation no, I, either. So this is an, a next mistake. People um, sometimes think we uh, eliminate uh, winning and losing. This is not correct. If you bring the players to their potential, then you will see the potential to be an attacker for this person is here and for the other one is here. If I have this person 100% developed, there's no chance to go higher. But this person will be maybe then the defender. If I do that at the beginning, I will limit the potential of this um, future defender in offensive uh, playing style. So if I develop this player, he can play defensive and offensive and is a much more a better defender with more options, but he's still a defender. If I say in a really uh, early stage, you are a defender, I will limit uh, this person to so much things he can use in defending and um, therefore we will have this separation yeah if we um, improve or tap the potential of every person we help we will still have these differences this is not a problem yeah we don't lose the differences but we have then defenders that can think from the perspective of an offender this is a big difference if you are on the right side and you are a defender on the right side and you know how the offender thinks you can play much better balls. And this means I have to bring this person in the education process um, to the offending uh, playing style as well. And then he has a benefit uh, or she from uh, these minutes or hours or years in the, offense, in the offensive playing style. And um, this is not a, a contradiction. And um, so our festivals that we play, 
um, in the with the young children, uh, we play seven minutes, and after seven minutes, we have a result. And in dependency of the result, this team goes up or down. This means we measure the performance seven after seven minutes, give a feedback, another seven minutes, another feedback, losing or winning, another seven minutes, and we do this seven times. This, this means in our competition, we have seven minutes, seven games, seven times feedback of being good or not. If you play the old style, <laughs> then you have one hour a game, and then you have a result, maybe designed by, um, uh, what is the word, uh, Zufall, um, what is the English word? Uh, by luck. Yeah. Yeah. And what then you learned? Nothing. Yeah. And in our game, every seven minutes, we have a feedback, winning or losing, winning or losing. Therefore, our style to apply the football to the children is much more related to winning and losing than the old style. So this is a discussion I had at the beginning of our changes with the German traditional coaches. They said, oh, you, you never have winning and losing. I said, bullshit. Look at what we, what we designed and how many um, results we have in the game. Yeah? So people uh, immediately start to um, talk about things, but they never went deeply into that and analyzed what's really going on. Yeah? Another thing we have from the um, haters of innovations, <laughs> they start to say things and they have no knowledge about these things, but um, they have an exact idea how they can, uh, will not do the things. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, there's something there about early adopters too, because I know a key milestone for you, Matthias, was when yeah. you presented at the ITK conference in 2018 in front of something yeah. like 1,200 UEFA Pro licensed coaches, one yeah. of which was Hansi Flick, who's the Germany assistant coach at the time to Wacken yeah. Law. Could you tell us what happened out of that interaction with Mr. Flick? <laughs> so Hansi is now a friend. Yeah, we are still in contact. He's the national coach. And um, so what happened is after my presentation, he went upstairs and came uh, to the presentation um, desk. And he waited two minutes because other people were in front of him. And at first he said, okay, Mr. Lochmann, uh, can I say Matthias? I said, no problem. <laughs> yeah. And then we uh, came to a discussion and he said, so Matthias, all the things you showed us today, we have to implement this as soon as possible here in Germany. Yeah. And um, then he invited me and I went to him at home and we stood one week then together in Silicon Valley in uh, Walnut Creek in this soccer development center. This was before he got the opportunity to get um, the second coach of Bayern Munich. Yeah? And so Hansi, um, yeah, we dis I discussed with him this game intelligence approach and I noticed that he applied a lot of these things um, to the national team as he was there the coach. Yeah, He was... Um, the second coach of the German national team during uh, Han um, during Hansi Löw uh, during Yogi Löw's time, but only during the successful time of Yogi Löw. Yeah? And he uh, told me that he uh, designed a lot of training sessions uh, with the team in 2014. And then I understood that Hansi was really a big, big part for the success of the German team in 2014. And I, for, for, for me, this idea validate, was validated as I saw what kind of changes came after he went to Bayern Munich uh, as a first coach. Yeah. We never saw these changes uh, any time before. We had the team of Bayern Munich. I was invited from him to, um, uh, they stood one week in Tegernsee at Bayern. Yeah? And I went with my son to the team there. And I saw some training sessions, but um, Hansi, after this period, got the opportunity to be the first coach of Bayern Munich. And he had the same players as Kovac, but the playing style 
was immediately different after some weeks. And he won seven titles in the, uh, in the next season. This was a, um, a record. And then I understood that he was really responsible in deep for the um, success story of the German uh, national team in 2014. And he showed us that he is able to repeat this success with Bayern Munich. And now he showed us he is able to repeat it again with the German national team. And um, so we had a lot of com um, the same ideas and we are friends and we are still in contact. And um, so God will, I have the chance to work to with, together with him maybe in the future, I don't know. And perhaps Matthias, could you elaborate upon some of the more, I suppose, notable changes which Hansi Flick implemented at Bayern Munich, which perhaps shared some sentiment or related to in somewhat in somewhat way to the game intelligence approach. So what I what I know is um, Hansi uh, applies this game intelligence approach. He I think in our discussion he he did it um, in the past, but after our exchanges uh, from the theoretical side, I think he is much more able to do it in a much better way. And what I can see is um, maybe. Um, um, in, in the training sessions, I saw he very often uses four goals or more to um, bring this uh, 360 degree environment to the players. This is so much important. Yeah. And uh, different other uh, things in the training processes that address these four faces characteristics in observing environment, understanding the things by giving the right questions to the people. Yeah this decision-making and um, the um, execution process, execution in a way that is related to the game. So we have, sorry, we have so many, co uh, co so many coaches, they do exercises, but the way the people um, execute the exercises are not um, under the pressure conditions you have in the game. If you play football in the game, you have different pressure conditions. So time pressure is one, yeah. Success pressure is another one. Complexity pressure is another one, and you have to design your exercises in a way that you apply these pressure conditions to the exercises. And if you uh, make a slalom in football, this kind of dribbling is not really uh, the same dribbling as you have in the game. In the game, you have a fast rippling in one direction, then a massive cut to the other side and changes of direction. You don't have this in slalom rippling. Yeah? And so you can decide these exercises in a way that they are more related to the movements you have in the game and the tactical situations you have in the game. And this is what uh, Hansi does. And um, he's a big communicator. This is one of his big advantages. And if you would like to apply the game intelligence approach, you have to be a communicator. Why? If you go back to the four phases, again, I repeat this many times today because uh, people can learn. First, you have to observe environment. Second, understand decision-making execution. The, the second phase is understanding. And you can target this understanding if you freeze the situation, go to the player and ask them, what is the solution? How many solutions do you have? The first thing is before you apply these exercises to the players, you have to create the environment in a way that you have different uh, degrees of freedom. Uh, with, you have to have two degrees of freedom in an exercise at minimum to make a decision. If you go to the slalom, you have no degrees of freedom because everything is fixed. If the coach says go to the slalom, then everything is fixed. Yeah, You can uh, solve this problem if two people uh, go into the slalom because at one moment they will um, be at the same location and they have to make a decision and the decision it is at the beginning at, of the exercise is not clear how the decision looks like during the exercise and you have to know how to construct the exercises that decision making in the exercise is possible but in a way that you can predict how you have to decide in the exercise. And Hansi works in that way. And he stops exercises and asks players, what is the right solution uh, now 
to solve the situation and he has clear rules and he has a clear vision how um, he would like to see playing the players. And he went to Thomas Tuchel. He went um, to different other coaches in the world and um, looked at their approaches. And um, so he always tries to learn. Yeah? And so I'm very happy uh, to, to have him and uh, sometimes a conversation. It, it's much, much less uh, since he is uh, back in professional uh, football as a coach in Bayern Munich, uh, you cannot imagine what kind of job this is. So uh, it is 24-7 um, every month, 365 days in the years. Yeah? You always have to be there for the club. Night, three, five o'clock. Uh, you cannot imagine. Um, so now he has more time because if you are a national coach, you have more degrees of freedom and uh, you you are not under pressure in that way every day. You are under pressure, but not every day, like the coach of Bayern Munich. Yeah. Fascinating detail. Um, getting back to the Foninho approach and the game intelligence yeah. approach, Matthias. Yeah. In fact, it's not only Germany where it's proven to be successful. I know for yeah. a fact you've been to visit a few friends of mine in the United States. You've been to yeah. places like China, Japan, Colombia, Italy even pioneering the approach. Have you been surprised, I suppose, by its international appeal? Again, uh, I, uh, I been, repeat the core question. Have you been the surprised? Core question? Yeah, have yeah. you been surprised by how successful and how popular the Foninho approach has been worldwide? So the thing is, it, it was... Um, the, the, all over the world, people use it in training. But what they do not understood is that they have to apply this to the competition. So often you see they play seven versus seven in the weekend with the six or seven year old boys. This game is designed completely wrong, seven versus seven in this age group. Yeah, You always see in all countries uh, where I gave the coaches clinic, I saw independently from the culture, Chinese, Colombian, African, always the same. If you play seven versus seven in this age group, you see one person staying in the goal and fixed in the goal. You see the, the best two players of each team have 80% of the contacts and the rest is not connected to the game. Yeah? And this is a construction mistake because this is game is much too complex for these brains in this age group. Yeah? And um, therefore you have to reduce, it is really, it is so easy. You have to reduce the amounts of player. Yeah? Then the players have more ball contacts. You don't need science for that. This is, uh, this is uh, everybody knows this. Yeah? The, the smallest team you can have is two persons. Then you start having a team. Yeah? One person is not a team. So team playing starts with two. Therefore, the youngest have to play two versus two. One year later, they have to play three versus three. One year later, they have to play four versus four. You never would give a children with shoe size 35 the shoes of 45 and say, okay, this is the right shoe for you because in the future, you will be an adult person. Therefore, you can use now the shoes of an adult. This only stupid persons would do that. But in football, we we did it and we do it. And so what people in all of the countries, nobody understood that they have to apply these things not in training alone. They have to go to the competition and change the competition mode. And some European countries did these changes some years ago, uh, Belgium at first. They uh, implemented uh, on an early stage 10 years ago, the small-sided game approach and um, the development of the, the Belgian nation, you can see. Yeah? And it depends very much on this approach because you will see 10 years later um, the results. Uh, because if a children starts with small-sided games with five, six years and it takes 10 years, 15, 
or 15 years, then you have a 20 year old player. And now we have this uh, situation in Belgium. And look how many play good players they have in uh, relation to the less people they have in their country. Yeah? How much uh, inhabitants has Belgium? Six? Uh, four? Four Something million? Like ten million? Is it around ten? ten? It's not much. It's not much. No, yeah. no. but uh, how many do we have in Germany? Eighty. Eighty, yeah. Eighty million. And think about what will go on in the future here. If now all these children in these 80, 80 million populations start to play small-sided games and translate this efficiency effect now to Germany in 15 years. And this is why what I explained Oliver Bioff, I told him, you have to understand that this nation will have no chance in the future if you do not combine the efficiency of the small-sided game um, approach with the mass you have of these playing uh, mass of uh, playing children in Germany. And think about, um, Im can you imagine what's going on, uh, would go on in the US if all the young children in the USA would start to uh, play small-sided games? This is the only chance the US could have to be successful in soccer in 10 or 15 years. Or China, think about that. China, they, they had this 50-point plan from the government to bring um, football uh, to world championship and the, the target was to win the world championship. I went to China four years ago and I said to the Chinese, never ever you will receive this, never ever. Yeah. So you, you, you took your money and you spent money to the third class people of Europe and they came to your country and um, they tried to implement the past. But if you would like to go to the future, you have to uh, implement the system of the future and you have to go to small sided games and then you have the impact of the efficiency and combine it with these million of children in China. The problem, the big problem in China is another thing. In China, it is not allowed to take, uh, take the decision by yourself. Yeah, in the, this society, always other people decide for you. And if you go to China and try to apply the small-sided games approach on basis of the game intelligence approach, you have to allow the children to decide into the game what is the right solution to do during the game. And as long as you have in China the system that does not allow people to decide by themselves, they have, will no, not have any chance to be successfully in this team sport. Because if you would like to be successfully in soccer, you have to control the chaos. And controlling the chaos, you cannot do outside as a coach and say to every player what's going on in this moment and this moment and take all the decisions for the player. The players have to decide on the pitch in the moment where the problem occurs. And if this is not allowed, no chance. It's absolutely fascinating, Matthias. And by right, just under an hour in a podcast doesn't do your idea justice at all whatsoever. But before we close this episode for now, what advice would you have for any coach at the moment who is involved within youth development and is responsible for any players which will play in the future? Uh, my advice is uh, rethink yourself, invest and never ever think you know everything. Yeah? If this occurs, then your uh, development is finished. Yeah? Um, ask questions and think about this uh, game intelligence approach. This can help you to design a, a complete new training. Uh, look at a situation in soccer or in football. You have these four phases again, yeah? observation, understanding decision making and execution and this is life yeah if you wake up in the morning you have to do this three seconds three seconds always the circle and in the day suddenly you start to have a game but you have to follow these circles again during the 90 minutes and in 90 minutes we have 1800 of these circles and who will win the game this is clear it is the team who is able to go in that cycle more successfully and faster. And how can you do? 
you have to apply this cycle and its core principles to your training. So analyze your exercises and ask yourself, stimulates my exercise observation, stimulates my exercise understanding, stimulates my exercise decision making. And is the, is the exercise from the way people move and the tactical setup, is it strongly related to the game? These four questions you have to ask you for every exercise and you have to ask for your behavior. Is my behavior designed to teach people um, decision making? If I permanently say, play, do this, do this, people cannot decide because I decide for them. This means my, communi my communication style works against nature because nature is this four faces model. Yeah? And you have to accept nature. If, in, if you work against nature, you have no chance. If you would like to be successful, you have to go with the nature. It's much more easy. And therefore, ask yourself, four faces, you know, you know these four faces, ask <clears throat> yourself, my exercise, is it designed um, in, in, uh, in the correct manner to fulfill these four phases? And is my coaching behavior designed in the right manner uh, to fulfill these four fa phases? This is the simple, really simple. Four phases, communication style, construction of exercises. And then you can go as high as you want. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. One which, one which I'm sure already I'll be listening back to a few times and countless others too. Matthias, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, Connor, thank you for giving me the opportunity and hopefully we can see us each other in person. And um, yeah, have a good time and uh, thank you. <laughs>